that place so dearly that I, the guilty one, may. Good morning, everybody. A very, very warm welcome to worship this morning. I hope you're keeping well and safe and looking after yourselves and your loved ones. And just as we come to worship, just as a little bit of a taster, that uh, when we do come to uh, look at scripture uh, and reflect on that, I've got a really personal question for you 
about the Holy Spirit, just to uh, to whet your appetite uh, on that. But as we do now come to worship, let me just uh, offer you a call to worship that's based on Psalm 95. The Lord says, come, come and sing for joy, offering him your thanks. Come and recognise his greatness and his glory. Come and confess him as maker and master, saviour and security, Lord and life. So let's come with glad and eager hearts to our worship this morning. And the Lord says, listen, listen to the urgency of his invitation. Listen to the tenderness of his warnings. Listen to the greatness of his promises. And so let's commit even now that we will listen, learn and obey. So let's come now to our first worship song and we sing along or just allow that worship to uh, to wash over us as we just really do bring our hearts and our minds to the worship of our great and wonderful God. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we praise and adore you. We celebrate your mighty power and your love. You've guided and preserved us in all of our ways. You're worthy of all the praise, the honour and the glory and the love. Your glory is beyond all of our thoughts because you're the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. You're beyond all letters and all words, beyond all that we can say or think. Accept our praise and adoration. Through the merits of your Son and our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And God of grace, 
and of love. Forgive us. We turn away from our sins and our lack of trust. God of grace and love, forgive us. We turn away from our sins and are holding back. God of grace and love, forgive us. We turn away from our sins and seek your healing. God of grace and love, forgive us. And may we have that assurance that we are set free, we are made whole and new in you. Amen.
Lord, we want to pray for those who are going through dark times and times of trouble and personal difficulties. We want to pray, pray for those who are undergoing treatment, for those who are ill and unwell, for those who are struggling with their mental health and anxiety and worry. And we want to pray, especially for us all at this time when it's not clear what to do especially in the face of injustice and violence and intolerance. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. But let us thank God and pray for those people whose courage and hope and service and care have lit up the dark places of this world. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we pray for ourselves that our Lord will give us the courage and compassion to see things clearly and tell the truth in love. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And may the love of God our Father make us unafraid and confident. And may the power of Jesus to save us and protect us and the joy of the Holy Spirit to heal and restore us and the grace of God to bless us and keep us truthful, now and forevermore. Amen. We've all got questions. Why am I here? What's the point? What difference does my life make? Thank you. Why do things that are so bad for us taste so good? Hey, hey Siri, do, do you, you pray? pray? I don't have an answer for that. How can I live life to the full? What can I really trust? What's my purpose? What do you think happens when you die? You're going straight to the gulags. Does anyone hear my prayer?
What's for dinner? What will make me happy? Why don't good things last forever? What is God really like? Has anyone else even asked themselves these questions? Hey everyone, I've got an amazing Alpha Online group here. Hi. A better place to ask life's big questions. Ask Alpha. So for our Bible reading today, I want to take you back to the reading we touched on very, very briefly last week. And it's Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 to 20. Paul is writing to Christians in the city of Ephesus, which is on the coast of modern day Turkey. And as you'll hear, he contrasts living in the everyday, in our own wants and desires, in the flesh, as it's often called in Scripture with living and being filled with the Holy Spirit. And it's really, really interesting that the Greek word he uses for being filled is not necessarily just a once and only filling, but it is that sense of an overflowing, a drenching, a continuous soaking of the Holy Spirit. So now let's come and hear that reading. Ephesians chapter 5 verses 15 to 20 be very careful then how you live not as unwise but as wise making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil therefore do not be foolish but understand what the Lord's will is do not get drunk on wine which leads to debauchery instead be filled with the Spirit. Speak to one another with psalms, hymns and spiritual songs. Sing 
and make music in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I want to ask you a personal question. And it's probably best, it's so personal that you just just come a bit closer to the screen and the speaker, just so I don't embarrass you. The question I want to ask you is, do you leak? Serious question. Do you leak? You know, I do, and I just wanted to check if you do. Now, before you think I have gone start raving bonkers, let me explain. A famous preacher by the name of D.L. Moody was once asked why he constantly urged thousands upon thousands of Christians to be filled with the Holy Spirit. They asked him, why is it so important for us to seek God's spirit and his direction and his power if we've already been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ? Well, the story goes that Moody thought for a moment and then he answered. Well, he said, because I leak. Now, he didn't literally mean that he had a hole in himself that allowed the Holy Spirit to leak out. But rather, Moody acknowledged that his own sinful nature worked constantly in opposition to the spirit and the holiness of God. And he knew that each day he needed more of God and more of his spirit to overcome the stubborn, sinless failings and frailties that lurked within him. So do you leak? If you're honest, we all do, don't we? We all leak the spirit. And in a sense, the biblical wording that we're going to have a look at now is in a sense that we grieve the spirit, we quench the spirit, and we therefore leak the spirit out of our lives. You see, due to our imperfections and our sins, you know, one day that we are overflowing with love and compassion and zeal for the Lord, and we see the Lord at work in mighty ways and want that mountaintop experience to continue day after day after day. And yet the next day we wake up and our flesh compels us to drag ourselves around like grumpy, snarling dogs, having a go at everyone who is in our way. We all desperately need the continual filling of the Holy Spirit to avoid the ups and downs of the Christian life. And the Spirit allows us to consistently do what we otherwise could never do in and through our own strength and in and through the flesh. But let's just go back to a basic understanding. You see, a person who is full of the Spirit is a person who has given up control of their lives because they profess Jesus as their Lord. And life in the Spirit, as the Apostle calls it is a life full of adventure, a life that isn't boring or routine. You see, scripture, the Bible says that where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. However, scripture is clear that being filled with the Holy Spirit is an ongoing thing that every Christian should seek. This doesn't mean we keep receiving the spirit over and over again. It doesn't mean that we keep being saved when filled every time we receive him. The Spirit lives in us upon salvation when we profess Jesus as our Lord. But scripture talks about a filling with the Spirit which is different to that. You see, filling means that we're able to receive something from the Spirit over and over again. And it's not something that is for our benefit, our, for our status in the faith. It's actually something that shines the light of Jesus to show others who he is. You see, being filled with the Spirit is not about us, it's about him. And the biggest mistakes we make is that it is all about us. 
when it is all about shining light on Jesus Christ as the Lord and Saviour of our lives. So what does scripture say about being filled with the Holy Spirit? Let's look at some of the evidence from scripture. You see, the Apostle Paul gives us an apostolic command to be filled with the Spirit in his letter to this church in Asia Minor. And if you look a bit deeper in some of his other letters uh, and what it looks like in the book of Acts, they are absolutely saturated with that command. Paul is pleading with people of what to do and to live their lives for Christ. And Paul addresses how we as Christians should live. So let's come back to Ephesians chapter 5 verses 15 to 20. You see, Paul commands them to be filled with the Holy Spirit rather than to be drunk on wine. You see, Paul contrasts here the difference between being drunk and being filled with the Holy Spirit. And he commands us to be filled, to live a life that is full of the Holy Spirit. And when you go back through that, there are many other passages in Scripture that also speak of this same thing. Sadly, we haven't got time to go through them all. But being filled, being overflowing, being flooded by the Holy Spirit is really crucial and really key. But some of those passages were when the person first gave themselves to Christ for freedom and for salvation. While some of those passages, if you go and look, were long after the person had come to faith. So what's going on? What does scripture mean by being filled with the Holy Spirit? Well, if you go and look at some of those passages, they give us the answer. You see, each time in scripture that we see the phrase filled with the Spirit, it's always associated with God's power and with a boldness in their faith. We see times where a person is empowered to live a life of faith which can only be done through the Holy Spirit. We don't come to faith because we choose it. You see the Spirit pushes and guides us towards it and we have to make that choice to respond. That I know this personally and it explains why for 28 years of my life I didn't do much or care about faith in Jesus but then things dramatically changed and the spirit empowered this change in me that I couldn't do it but the spirit for whatever reason chose a particular moment in my life to do it but we also see in those passages they're talking about being spirit filled the people being enabled to speak words of faith. In times when they didn't know what to say, the Spirit came upon them and filled them with the words they needed to profess, to talk about Jesus Christ. And scripture shows us so often that we get in the way. Interesting enough, the Dictionary of Bible Themes describes it like this. To be filled with the Holy Spirit is to be energised and controlled by the third person of the Godhead in such a way that under the acknowledged lordship of Jesus Christ, the full presence and power of God are experienced. Spirit filling leads to renewal, obedience, boldness in testimony and a resting quality in believers' lives. All through the book of Acts, if you go and have a look, we see believers experience God's power when they are filled in the Spirit. We see a consistent quality of the character of their lives, of fruit in the person. We see those who are not bold, who become bold in their ability to speak words of witness to give answers in difficult situations that only the Spirit could give. You can also go and notice in those passages, people being filled and that leading to the quality of their character 
and the ability for them to share Christ with others. But it never leads to empowering someone to be important or special in the eyes of others. It always leads people to Jesus and believers living their lives like Jesus. You see, the moment being filled with the Spirit becomes about you is actually the moment you've abandoned and you've leaked the Spirit. That's why the Spirit filling is an ongoing thing, because we get in the way. We quench the Spirit, we grieve the Spirit and we leak the Spirit. You see, Normally, for Paul, living a life of the Spirit is the only way that we're going to live the life that Jesus calls us to live. It's about pointing people to Jesus who has all the power in heaven and on earth. So what is that filling of the Holy Spirit? Let me remind you, it's, it's fairly simple. Being filled with the Spirit is to be controlled by the Spirit. It's living God's will rather than your own will. This is why Paul says, instead of letting wine control you, let the Holy Spirit control you. Actually, you should be praying and seeking for the Holy Spirit to control your lives. You see, the Holy Spirit lives in us upon our salvation, but many of us are not controlled by the Spirit. When we let our sinfulness control us, we're controlled and live by the flesh. But when the Holy Spirit controls us, we open the door to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And this is what every believer should be seeking, to be controlled by the Spirit of God. But our sinful nature says so many times, uh, 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 no, 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 I'm in control. Nobody is going to control me apart from me. But professing Jesus as Lord means giving up the right to have control. You see, if the Spirit controls our thoughts, our thoughts become pure. If the Spirit controls our actions, our actions show the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. You know, if you go back to Paul's letter to the Galatians, chapter 5, verses 22 to 23, he says the Spirit of the fruit is love, is joy, is peace, is forbearance, is kindness, is goodness, is faithfulness, is gentleness and self-control. Against such things there is no law. These things are evident in our character when the Spirit is controlling us. But if I am in control of my life, I am just full of the flesh and nothing more. You see, Paul, in the verses just before this, in verses 19 to 21, says this. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality impurity, debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred and discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Just think about it. Those who live by the flesh will not inherit the kingdom of God. He's writing to Christians. But those who live by the Spirit are living in God's kingdom now and forever. In other words, filled by the Spirit, you're living a Spirit-filled life. Not not being filled, you're living a flesh-filled life. You see it in the book of Acts. Uh, an awful lot. You see, God takes someone who is weak in the flesh and makes them bold in the spirit over and over uh, again. So how do we live a life filled with the Holy Spirit, a spirit filled life? Firstly, let me remind you and explain how we end up living our faith 
without the power of the Holy Spirit. How we leak him. The two most common barriers to a life in the Spirit are grieving the Holy Spirit and quenching the Spirit. I talked about this a tiny bit last week when I pointed out that the, per- the, the Holy Spirit is a person with feelings. And the Apostle Paul says this in, in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 30. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. There are things many of us do in our lives that deeply grieve God. Listen to the list that Paul goes on to say. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. To put it simply, that you can't be filled with bitterness and be filled with the spirit. That you can't be filled with anger and be filled with the spirit. You can't be filled with malice, the desire to harm someone or have ill will against anyone and be filled with the Holy Spirit. You can't be filled with hatred and be filled with the Holy Spirit. You can't say to be living for Christ, spirit filled, if there are any of those things in your life. And the second issue in believers' lives that hold us back from the spirit-filled life is the quenching of the spirit. Thank goodness the spirit is in us and keeps pulling us and nudging us back to the spirit-filled life. But there is that question, how do you respond to that? Nudging and pulling and guiding, or, or do you let your flesh prevail. You see that second issue which holds us back from the spirit-filled life and makes us leak. It comes from a very simple verse in Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 19. He simply says do not quench the spirit. To quench the spirit is to stifle or suppress his work in you. To resist the change that the Spirit is calling you to because it might disrupt your comfort, for instance. Essentially, to quench the Spirit means you resist the Spirit in your life. It it means you worry, you struggle with fear, you're easily affected by the world around you. That maybe your life is full of greed or pride or gossip and you always want things your way. Quenching the spirit means that you're living life by your terms and condition and by your control, not God's. You see, the scary part about grieving the spirit and quenching the spirit is that we are often convinced that everyone else is doing it, but not us. We don't even notice that we are living in a way that God is grieved about. This is especially scary because many people living that way are regular attenders of churches and claim to follow Jesus. And it's why the world sees many uh, people in churches as hypocrites. It's why Paul commands us to seek the life of the Spirit, to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You see, in Galatians chapter 5, verse 16, he gives an answer to these problems when he says, So I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. You see, if you start to notice the things that I've just listed a little bit earlier that are part of your life, maybe you start to notice your distance from God. You start to notice the lack of power in your life. You start to notice that no one in your life ever hears about Jesus from you. And if you notice, and then you can open the door to living the life with the Spirit. 
becoming aware of your sin and your failings and your frailties. And that's just the first step. And then you have the opportunity to live in the spirit. And all you have to do is to repent. It's a change of heart and mind, which is internal. And then you have to change your actions, which are external. But it's not in terms of repentance, not just a case of saying, oops, sorry, caught again, won't do it again, but carry on doing it. But you've got to start to notice that maybe we're messed up, we're self-centred, and how we naturally struggle with this. And then maybe you get those glimpses and you see how we are all broken. Because in the Bible, Paul says, in the moments of our brokenness, we can see Christ the most. When we don't have anything else blocking our view and our way. You see, when life is good, we can act like we don't need the Spirit. But Scripture says, no, you can't. You need the Spirit to live in God's power. You see, if power is lacking in your life, you're grieving the Spirit. You're quenching the Spirit. And you're even leaking the Spirit. You see, when church is boring... You're quenching and grieving the spirit. We need to ask for forgiveness and God will pour out his spirit upon us. So how? To be filled and to be continually filled by the spirit. Stop grieving the Holy Spirit. Work your way through that list that I read out for you and stop doing them to stop quenching the holy spirit go over that list and stop doing them and start walking in the spirit being continuously filled by the spirit giving control to the holy spirit and willing to open all of your life up to the holy spirit be willing to experience change to live fully in the spirit you see, we have to become honest with ourselves and each other's. Life in the Spirit is what all believers should be seeking. You see, it is attainable. It is possible to live how Jesus calls us to live. But we need the Spirit to empower us, empower us to live this way. Life on the edge to control you. Goodness to point people to Jesus. To make the point, I want to share a quote with you from a modern day, very, very famous theologian called Stanley Howos. And he puts it like this. The modern world enjoys thinking that we have at last come to the point in human development when we live under no control other than self-control. And then he goes on to say... At Pentecost, we discover that the lives we're living are not our own, because the Holy Spirit not only enters our time, but also commandeers our lives. We can hope for lives that are adventuresome, even wild and unpredictable. When we give up our life to Jesus, we become more like Jesus. We don't have to do this on or through our own strengths or our own efforts. When we're spirit filled, we're empowered to live the life that he's called us to live. But if we hold on to control, we continue to live life in the flesh, grieving, quenching and leaking the Holy Spirit. But giving up to the Lordship of Jesus Christ that he fills us he will give us the words to say he gives us the life to live we become attractive there is something substantially different about us 
And it's not about being a, a good person. But people will say, what do they have that I don't have? They'll think, I want some of that. They're different. Because it's more than being a good person. There is evidence in scripture that when people lived spirit-filled lives, those around them were coming to Christ. But the spirit-filled life demands full surrender, surrender to Jesus Christ. It means we have to give up our lives so we can start to live life properly. The Holy Spirit is the life-giving power that is able to create, to sanctify and to grow every believer if they're willing to give their whole self to God. So are you going to continue to grieve, to quench and to leak God's spirit? Are you ready to let God take control? Are you ready to give yourself once again to Jesus Christ as your Lord, as your master, as your boss? Are you ready to be constantly filled by the Holy Spirit? To live radically where change is an everyday part of your life. That's what Paul calls us to when he commands us to be constantly filled, giving our lives up so we can be alive. It's your choice. The Holy Spirit is nudging is pulling some of you right now. What's your choice going to be? Let us pray. Jesus, we want you to be our Lord and our Master. And we want to receive more from you. Thank you that we're totally safe with you. And we don't want to limit what you may want to do in us. And so we choose to give you total control over us and our lives. Free us from any fear of what you might do or how you might do it in our lives. But we lay our lives down before you. And may you take away any concerns of what we'll look like or sound like or act like when we are filled with the Holy Spirit. Free us to be the people that you created us to be. And we ask you to lead us so that we can become more and more the people that you want us to be and that you, Jesus, will become more and more real and at the centre of our lives in the days and months and years to come. Amen. Every moment I'm away
So as we bring our worship to a close, let us pray. Father, we just ask that we would all, as we go into this week, increasingly have the mind that was in Jesus Christ. We would have his self-forgetting humility, his interest in common things, his love for all people, his compassion for the broken, his tolerance for the mistaken, his patience for the slow. And in all our work and in all our duties, may we continually be sensitive to the guidance and leading of the Holy Spirit. And we ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And may the blessing of God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. 
Trumpet sound. 